Hi, this is Dan Alvarez. I'm one of the founding partners of Synergy Settlement Services. Wanted to welcome everyone to our Total Medicare Compliance Seminar. Uh, we're grateful that you would spend this time with us today. Look forward to letting you hear from all of our experts on all things Medicare and the intersection of personal injury cases and Medicare, Medicare compliance, and Medicare's future interests. We're also grateful to have some partners presenting on this call as well. Uh, thank you for joining us and uh, hope you enjoy it. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rasa Umagali. I'm an attorney and the director of Synergy's Medicare Secondary Payer Compliance Group. And I'd like to welcome you to our Medicare Secondary Payer Compliance Summit. We are going to begin the presentation today with an overview of the Medicare Secondary Payer Act, as well as the Medicare program itself. Here is my contact information. And these are just some of the Medicare Secondary Payer Compliance services which Synergy offers. We provide conditional payment resolution. We're able to help assist in identifying and verifying if there are Medicare Advantage liens. We have a Medicare Expert Case Evaluation or MECI service. If it's determined that a Medicare set-aside allocation would be appropriate, this is something that we do. We also assist with Medicare set-aside funding and administration. So before we jump into the Medicare Secondary Payer Act, let's just talk about what Medicare actually is. For those of you who are not that familiar with Medicare, Medicare is a federal health insurance program for people that have a sufficient number of working credits in their history. So usually you're going to find somebody who is eligible for Medicare by virtue of their age, which is 65. Certain younger people might qualify for Medicare benefits if they have social security disability or people with end stage renal disease. Now, there are basically different parts of Medicare that people can enroll in. You can enroll in traditional Medicare Part A, which is a hospital benefit, or Medicare Part B, which is an outpatient physician type of service benefit. Medicare Advantage plans provide coverage under Medicare Part C. These Medicare Part C plans um, provide all of the services that are covered under Medicare Part A, and Part B along with some additional services. Medicare Part D is a plan that is a prescription drug coverage plan. So, you know, the, the way that we got to this point in terms of the Medicare Secondary Payer Act is that the Medicare trust fund started to deplete more quickly than anticipated. So in the early 1980s, Congress passed the Medicare Secondary Payer Act along with a series of regulations in an effort to shore up the financial integrity of the Medicare system. So this Medicare Secondary Payer Act basically makes Medicare a payer of last resort in certain situations. So you can see that the statute here, 42 USC 1395 YB2A states that Medicare is a secondary payer when payment has been made or can reasonably be expected to be made under and this is important, it identifies workers' comp law or plan of the U.S. or state, an automobile or liability insurance policy or plan, or under no-fault insurance. So whenever you have these three other plans involved in your case, Medicare may be a secondary payer. Medicare also, though, wanted to make sure that Medicare beneficiaries were not going without medical treatment while their cases were pending or were being negotiated. So Medicare has agreed to make payment of injury-related treatment for a Medicare beneficiary on the condition that the Medicare trust fund is reimbursed for these payments when the cases settle or are adjudicated. So now, how do you decide that anybody is responsible for reimbursement to Medicare? So Medicare and 42 CFR section 411.22 regulation put out that a primary payer's reimbursement obligation to Medicare is going to be demonstrated by three things, a judgment, the second part is a payment conditioned upon the recipient's compromise, waiver, or release of payment for items included in a claim against the primary payer. And the key there is whether or not there's a determination or admission of liability. As long as a settlement payment was made, Medicare's position is that they are a secondary payer. 
And then the last section is or by other means. And this would be a situation where there's a contract, for example, to provide coverage under PIP or MedPay. So now, you know, in the area of workers' comp, you know, many people are very familiar with what Medicare secondary payer obligations involve because there have been many guidance memos that have been consolidated and put together in the Workers' Compensation Medicare Set Aside Reference Guide. We don't have that in the liability settlement, excuse me, in the liability case. In the liability settlement situation, we have two memos essentially from CMS. The first is the Stalkup memo in May of 2011, which basically says that both workers' comp and liability cases have the same obligations when it comes to avoiding a cost shift of expenses to the Medicare trust fund. We also have the treating physician written certification memo in September of 2011. So what Medicare has been doing, though, is they have been trying their hand to come up with additional guidance when it comes to liability settlements. They actually tried to put out proposed rules in, I believe it was 2012 and 2013. They took comment from the industry stakeholders, and then they ended up withdrawing those proposed rules. So December 2018 rolls around, and once again, we have another stab at rulemaking by Medicare when it comes to the liability space. And so this slide shows what the current language of the notice of proposed rule for liability MSAs looks like. Um, it, although it was initially put out in December of 2018, it has been continually kicked three, four months down the road. Now we're supposed to be waiting for this proposed rulemaking. The new date is October of 2021. But this rule basically states that this proposed rule would clarify, and this is important, existing Medicare secondary payer obligations associated with future medical items, services related to liability insurance, including self-insurance, no-fault insurance, and workers' compensation settlements, judgments, awards, or other payment. And this proposed rule indicates that it's going to clarify that any obligation to satisfy Medicare's interest in regard to future medical items is going to be on the individual or Medicare beneficiary. This proposed rule is also going to remove obsolete regulations. So when this proposed rule came out in you know, December of 2018, you know, everybody was sort of up in arms in terms of trying to figure out, well, what does this mean? Are they actually going to do something? So there were meetings in Baltimore in the fall of 2019 where there were many CMS decision makers in attendance. You had top MSP compliance professionals there to talk about, well, what would liability regulations look like, you know, in the context of Medicare set-asides? And what the bottom line is, Medicare has made it very clear that they are ready to go. It is going to be a voluntary review program similar to what the workers' comp program is, which is also voluntary. It's going to apply to beneficiaries and to those with a reasonable expectation. So when you think about Medicare secondary payer compliance obligations, it's helpful to look at the three different components of MSP compliance when you're analyzing a case. You know, the first thing that you have to consider, and it's pretty clear, is that if Medicare, whether payments were made by traditional Medicare Part A and Part B, or by a Medicare Advantage plan under Part C, or a drug plan under Part D, these groups have the right to be reimbursed for payments that were made in connection with the injury prior to settlement, because these payments are conditional payments. The other thing that you have to consider is the fact that Medicare is prohibited from making payment for conditions when there's another primary payer that is responsible for this. And this would analysis would look at, well, is there going to be post-settlement injury-related Medicare covered treatment? Does my settlement actually contemplate this in the way that you were negotiating the settlement and the way that the settlement language is written? So these two pieces, the past payments and the need to avoid future payments, they're all tied in by Section 111 reporting, which essentially is the enforcement mechanism. It lets Medicare know through data collection that 
payments may have been made prior to settlement that should be reimbursed and that Medicare should not be making certain post-settlement payments. So the rest of our presentation this afternoon is going to look at all the different components of MSP compliance. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Allison Oswald. I am one of the Lean Resolution Specialists here at Synergy Settlement Services. I have been asked to uh, give you an introduction to the Medicare secondary payer um, recovery process and the conditional payments. So here is just a little information about me. Uh, some of what I'm going to be discussing today is the specific procedure around the conditional payment process, step-by-step uh, -step for what you should expect after Medicare has been put on notice, um, some information about pre-demand and post-demand considerations you should be making, um, and I'm also going to discuss the appeals process, uh, the waivers and compromise opportunities uh, that Medicare has written in um, for you and the beneficiaries alike. Just a brief overview, um, you'll hear me talk about the BCRC, which is the Benefits Coordination and Recovery Center. They are the group that's responsible for making sure that Medicare gets repaid um, on any conditional payments that they have made. A conditional payment is what Medicare considers um, every payment that's made for a service that they think another payer is responsible for. Um, Medicare makes the payments because they know the beneficiary may not have the money to pay for the bill at the time of service. They also recognize that often these uh, other responsible parties aren't going to be paying for a considerable amount of time, uh, but they make their payment conditional because they do expect repayment at the time settlement judgment award or other payment is made. Uh, before I dive in too far, I did want to give you just a brief introduction to the Medicare Secondary Payer Recovery Portal. You'll hear me talk about the portal as an opportunity for you to uh, communicate with Medicare during this process. Um, this is what the intro screen looks like. I provided you with the web link. If you're not familiar with it, I would highly encourage uh, that you give it a shot. Um, it is certainly the quickest and most efficient way to communicate with Medicare about um, any of their recovery claims. Um, and I'll show you here the types of things that you can do through the portal that historically were always done through mail and fax um, with Medicare. So just a picture of what it looks like once you get into a file, but the different services you can use through the portal are actually reporting the case to Medicare, letting them know um, about the specific case you're pursuing, the date of incident, um, as well as some of the injury information. Um, after they've opened the file, you can confirm their file status, view the conditional payments, actual list of the claims that they have identified, which they believe are related to your incident. You can request that Medicare send you letters, um, but you can also view, save, and print the correspondence from Medicare's letters that they have issued so far, which is a huge time saver and tool um, in instances where maybe a Medicare letter that you are pretty sure you received has gotten lost. Uh, you can look it up in here and print it out. Um, you can also check to see if a demand has been issued yet, and then a whole other gamut of things. You can submit your disputes, update authorizations, uh, you can submit first level appeals, notice of settlement, I mean, pretty much anything that has historically been done by fax, you can now do through the portal, and it's definitely the most efficient way um, to communicate with them at this time. So what's the first step in getting things started with Medicare when you have a liability case? First thing is going to be reporting the case to the BCRC. Like I said, you can do so through the portal. Um, you can also fax or mail in information to Medicare. But what they're looking for is just notice of a pending liability, no fault or workers comp case, um, so that they can check their records to see if they've made any claims or if they paid any claims that are related to the incident. Um, once Medicare is notified of that, once you've reported the injuries and uh, the date of incident, they're going to first issue a rights and responsibilities letter, which is just a generic letter that explains, um, you know, what you should expect, what Medicare is looking for, um, just a standard letter. After that, they are going to begin looking through um, the, the backside of their system to see what payments they have made and try to uh, correlate 
those to the injuries that you've reported to see what is related to the case. Um, they're using the information that you report initially. So any injury that you that you gave them, they're going to look through. So any back injury reported, they're going to look at all the back claims, um, so on and so forth. They start their recovery search from the date of incident reported. So it's very important that um, that information be accurate. Um, and then they end that at the date of settlement, judgment, or award. So if you open your Medicare file while your case is still pending, Medicare is going to run from the date of incident through today's date, and then they'll continue running checks until um, they're notified that settlement has occurred. If it so happens that Medicare is notified of um, a case after the case has already settled, this often happens when defense um, reports their mandatory reporting of any payment made. Uh, rather than issuing a conditional payment letter, they're going to issue a conditional payment notice. The distinction is important because a notice gives you about 30 days to um, dispute any claims or correct any incorrect settlement information they were provided. Um, so you do want to review all the letters that come in to see if there's any specific deadlines that are given. Um, but typically that information um, included in the letter is the same. It's just whether or not you have a timeline to respond. Once you start getting either a conditional payment letter or a conditional payment notice, this is when you want to really review the claim summary to see if the conditional payments they have included are truly related to your incident. If you find um, that there are claims that could arguably be related but are really not related, um, when you submit your dispute, you want to submit as much documentation you can to support your position so that Medicare has everything when they review it. Some disputes are more simple. You know, if you have a back injury and you find that they had a sinus infection treatment that's included, you know, those can be much more simply and effectively disputed. Um, but the closer the claim is to something that could be related, the more documentation you, su you should submit to dispute that. Uh, the BCRC will adjust their conditional payment amount if they agree that certain claims are not related to the case. So once they receive the dispute, um, you can monitor and see the progress through the portal to see if it's still pending review. Um, but they will send you a decision letter at the end of their review to let you know if they agree with your dispute um, and they've removed claims. But if they did not, they'll tell you it was unfavorable and possibly give you uh, some reasonings for why they decided against it, um, so you can resubmit your dispute if necessary. Once your case has settled, the BCRC does ask that you report that settlement to them, and that's going to be any time you have a settlement, judgment, award, or other payment, you have to notify them. So the information they're looking for is the date of settlement, the amount of the settlement, and then the amount of your attorney's fees and other procurement costs that the beneficiary actually had to pay for your service. Um, and once they have all of that information, Medicare is going to issue their final demand. So the BCRC is going to look at that termination date, which is the, again, the date of the settlement um, award that you received. They're going to do one final look before they actually issue the demand to see if there's any related claims that they maybe did not include on any of the conditional payment notices prior. Um, and once they have completed that process, they will issue a formal recovery demand letter advising you of the amount owed to Medicare. This demand does have a timeline to repay. They give you 60 days to pay the demand. And after that, they start to add on interest to that amount. The demand issuance is not final in the sense that you still have an opportunity to appeal that amount if there's additional unrelated claims. And you can still submit arguments to Medicare um, to request either compromise or waiver to that amount, um, but the interest will start tolling after 60 days regardless. Um, and then if not paid after 150 days after the demand is issued, um, they will refer it to the Department of Treasury for collection. So it's important to be mindful that once a demand is issued, you do have a timeline before they start to add on interest. Um, what we often recommend is that the attorney or our clients go ahead and pay that final demand and if we're successful in an appeal or a waiver or something Medicare will issue a refund um, for any amount that they removed so to avoid the interest we recommend paying um, but just be mindful if you decide not to um, that they will start adding on interest after 60 days 
Um, with Medicare, they do apply a procurement reduction. They, they don't want to take um, any additional percentage than the injured party did for paying for procurement costs. So they calculate their final demand and their reduction with two different methods. So if you have a, a case where your Medicare lien is less than the total settlement, then they're going to look at the ratio of procurement costs to the settlement and apply that same ratio to their lien. So it's a reduction of fees and costs from their lien amount. However, as we often see, if you have a Medicare lien that is equal to or exceeds your total settlement, then Medicare is going to handle it differently. They're going to look at the gross settlement, they're going to subtract out the fees and costs, and then the rest of the money they're going to demand to themselves, which leaves nothing for the injured party in that case. And honestly, neither of these calculations really takes into any account the liability issues you had in your case, possibly the low policy limits, hardship. Their, their demand is definitely in the interest of the agency. Um, so that, that's where their calculation comes in. And then we start looking at opportunities to try to get that reduced. So when you have a demand that's issued, we recommend the, the following steps to to review. Uh, first is going to be making sure that they applied the procurement reduction correctly. There are often times that Medicare doesn't apply a procurement reduction at all, either because they received the settlement notice from defense and they weren't aware of any fees and costs, or perhaps the information was submitted incorrectly. Um, so you always want to review to make sure that there is a a procurement reduction that was made equal to what you're expecting from the final conditional payment amount. You're going to need to do an additional claim summary. Like I said, even if even if early on in your case you had disputed all unrelated claims, you had success with those and they were removed, you have to check that demand letter because they run a check up until the date that it is issued. So we often see claims that are added um, that had not been seen before on any conditional payment letter, and then you have to appeal those at that time. So always review that final demand claim summary to make sure everything included is related to your case. And from there, you are also going to start making considerations of, is there a financial hardship that my client and beneficiary has experienced because of this accident? Um, was there a limited settlement? Do we need to request a compromise? Um, because we're trying to get some money in the hands of the beneficiary. These are considerations that you wanna make at the time of demand. Uh, I wanna reiterate though, that paying the demand does not limit the success or opportunity of success for your appeals or waivers. Um, I've had some people uh, that were concerned that if they paid the demand that their appeals wouldn't be heard or that the injured party would then never see that money and that's simply not the case. Medicare issues refunds for uh, for payments that were made and claims ultimately are determined to be unrelated, um, they send that money back. So if you're trying to avoid interest, again, we recommend paying so that um, that interest doesn't toll, but we can still get the money back um, if Medicare agrees with our argument. When it comes to appeals, Medicare has a, a specific um, list of appeals to go through. So when we're talking about a Medicare appeal, we really want to consider if the claims are related to the incident. Um, we're not considering the hardship arguments, uh, you know, limited settlement. Appeals are going to be if the claims are really related to your incident. Um, here at Synergy, we assist with our clients' appeals at uh, first and second level. After that, um, once you start going through hearings, we're not able to assist. Um, but we do have clients that will take it that far if there really are claims that Medicare hasn't agreed to remove. Um, and it's important to note that before you can step in front of a federal judge to have your claim heard, you really have to exhaust all of their other internal processes first. So if you're fighting Medicare all the way through, you do have to make sure you're meeting the timelines for each of these individual appeals um, if you ever want to have an opportunity to go before a judicial review. For uh, full and partial waivers, when you're considering things like financial hardship, um, Medicare has three statutory provisions that they have in place to um, give them the authority to accept less than their full demand amount. Um, I have them listed here. I'll talk about them a little more. But in large part, it's just considering if the recovery would defeat the purposes of the chapter would be against good equity and good conscience. They don't want to do so. So for financial hardship, you're looking at uh, 1870C of the Social Security Act. 
which gives Medicare the authority to grant the waivers to beneficiaries um, if they find that repaying the conditional payments would pose a financial hardship. Um, in order to consider this request, they require that the beneficiary fill out a financial, uh, financial form, and we also recommend submitting a hardship letter written by the beneficiary to the agency um, to help sort of argue their case. Um, but we've had great success here in uh, proving the financial hardship and seeing Medicare waive their recovery. Another option is the best interest of the program, wherein uh, the secretary can waive their recovery if they determine that waivers in the best interest of their program. Um, and then there's also a compromise request opportunity, which is through the FCCA. And Medicare lays out a couple of reasons that they would consider a compromise. So if the cost of collection uh, is too great to the agency to justify enforcing the collection, if there's just an inability to pay within a reasonable time, or the chances of successful litigation were questionable. Um, so for each of these different arguments, we have seen success in getting refunds back to beneficiaries. Um, so it's just a matter of really looking at the specifics of your case to determine which is the best way to proceed. Um, and that sort of goes along the lines for, for this whole Medicare process. There are different systems in place at different times in a case where you can try to maximize your injured party's recovery by minimizing what Medicare is getting repaid. The key to success is just knowing when to start each process in which uh, which different process is best for what you're looking for. So at Synergy, we sort of divide them into two classes. We have a Medicare reduction, which is a lot of the stuff pre-demand, um, submitting disputes, making arguments about relatedness of claims, um, and making sure that the attorney fee and cost reduction is applied appropriately. And again, that's all really looking at if the treatment included is related to your case. And then we have a refund side where the final demand has been issued and we're looking at if uh, it's in the best interest of Medicare and or the beneficiary to try to collect full value or if a waiver is warranted. So if you need any assistance with figuring out um, if there's an opportunity for your client to get um, their Medicare lien or demand reduced, we're happy to help with that, um, but just be mindful of um, the processes that are in place and there's a lot of chances to save your client money when it comes to Medicare. So if you need any assistance with that, feel free to reach out to us and I thank you for your time. Good afternoon. Thank you again for joining the Medicare Secondary Payer Compliance Summit. This portion is on the interplay between Medicare payments and hospital liens, how those two things interact with one another. My name is Michael Walrath. And I normally only have an opportunity to present on the reasonable value of hospital care, but here in the Medicare context, there are some important things to go over with how these two different payment methodologies interact. The overarching question, and I say a little bit jokingly, what would Medicare do, is what does Medicare think hospitals are supposed to do with regards to billing Medicare beneficiaries? Medicare has promulgated some guidance on these questions, but as we're gonna see, we're left with the question of does that guidance matter? The position that Medicare has taken is indeed quite plaintiff friendly. Medicare's position is that providers and hospitals have limited options and binding obligations when it comes to billing Medicare recipients. According to CMS, Medicare uh, providers when they are hospitalized, the hospitals have to wait 120 days to bill Medicare, that is called the promptly period. And after that 120 days, then the provider has the opportunity to choose whether or not to bill the claim to Medicare or to place a lien against the liability settlement. So if a liability case does not settle within 12 months, that is called the timely filing period, then according to Medicare at least, the providers or the hospitals have to drop all claims and liens. That may come as a surprise to you. It certainly did to me when I first became aware of this Medicare guidance. Providers and hospitals cannot bill Medicare or the Medicare beneficiary. 
after the timely filing period expires. Again, that timely filing period being 12 months from the date of discharge from the hospital. This information has been promulgated several times by Medicare, most recently on the Medicare Learning Network, the MLN, in a guidance with the number SE17018. If anyone would like to get a copy of that guidance and can't find it themselves, I do believe you can just Google SE17018 and it'll come up. However, I'm happy to get it for you, or if you contact your Synergy Relationship Manager, we can get you that guidance in full. A couple of the questions that were asked that are pertinent to today's conversation is question number four, do the timely filing rules still apply if a provider is waiting for a liability recovery? And the answer was yes. Uh, Medicare stated in its guidance that liability insurance does not change or extend Medicare's timely filing requirements. And again, those timely filing requirements are 12 months from the date of discharge. The other most relevant question is how long can a claim or lien be maintained? And it's essentially the same answer. It's again, 12 months. And CMS said very clearly, and this is a quote directly from the CMS guidance, which was issued to all hospitals and providers who treat Medicare beneficiaries. They said CMS liability insurance billing policy is that providers are required to drop their claims and liens and terminate all billing efforts once the timely filing period expires, unless the claim is paid or settled prior to the expiry of that period. What that means is if the, the operative dates to be looking at are the date of discharge and the date of the settlement. If case settles prior to the 12 months, they can maintain the lien beyond the 12 months. However, if the case has not settled and the 12 months expires, according to Medicare, the hospital is supposed to drop their lien. Another important issue that was raised in this guidance, uh, someone asked about was how much can a provider or hospital bill in a third party liability situation? Medicare said that a couple of things. One, if Medicare is billed first and then the provider sends that payment back to Medicare, the provider is limited to the Medicare reimbursement. So in other words, and some of you may have experienced this, I know I have quite a few times, I've received a lot of uh, inquiries about this where, and it, it typically happens with air ambulance cases more so than hospitals in my experience, but the provider bills Medicare right away. They know the patient's a, a Medicare beneficiary, they bill Medicare, they receive payment, then they learn that there's a liability recovery and they decide maybe I should send this money back and bill my full bill charges to this liability recovery so they do that and they try to get more. And Medicare's position on that is they are limited to Medicare reimbursement if they have billed Medicare. Um, another thing that the guidance set out was that a provider can bill their actual charges, but they're limited to the amount of the settlement, less fees and costs. Essentially, uh, you could have a large hospital bill, let's call it a $100,000 hospital bill, but only a $25,000 policy, a $25,000 recovery. And that would limit the hospital's ability to lean that case, according to Medicare, by the amount of the recovery, less fees and costs. Sort of an equitable distribution, but not quite, because nothing equitable about it to the patient in that math uh, basically means that the patient gets nothing, the attorney gets fees and costs, and the hospital gets the rest, in my example. Again, this is Medicare's position on what should happen in a limited settlement scenario with a Medicare beneficiary. Most importantly, once the timely filing period expires, providers may only bill for non-covered services, coinsurance and deductibles. Again, another version of the same theme. Liens must be dropped after the 12 month timely filing period. However, the provider would still be able to bill for things that Medicare doesn't cover and for any coinsurance or deductibles that the patient would owe, regardless of whether Medicare paid or not. If this guidance that I've just explained sounds too good to be true to you, as it does to me, I will tell you, unfortunately, that's because it effectively is. Medicare guidance is not the law. Um, 
What it is, is it's Medicare's interpretation of the Medicare regs. Medicare regulations are the law. Medicare's interpretation of those regulations are not the law. There have been several cases that go down this road and all lead to the same place, a Supreme Court case having stated that agency interpretations in manuals, enforcement guidelines, et cetera, are not entitled to the force of law. And that principle has been applied to Medicare guidance, such as the one that I'm discussing. There are several cases that deal with exactly this guidance, but a previous version of it, but this same concept that hospitals have to drop their liens after a year. And those cases all came to the same conclusion that it is not the law. Uh, it is also contrary, according to some cases, to existing case law on these issues. And it was pointed out, contradicts the Secondary Payer Act itself. Um, and I will quote, it undermines the obvious cost shifting purpose of the secondary payer statute by imposing a cutoff date that appears to lack any connection to whether a source other than Medicare can be reasonably expected to pay. And imagine an extreme situation, for example, a mass tort, tens of thousands of Medicare beneficiary plaintiffs that is going to settle in two years or three years. And after one year, suddenly the hospitals lose their liens against that massive pot of uh, recovery money. And the reality is the Secondary Payer Act is very clear. Medicare should not be paying if there are other sources in this arbitrary 12 month period, according to the court in Alaska at least, runs contrary to that obvious purpose of the statute. So what that leaves us with is the reality that many hospitals do not, in fact, most, I would almost say all hospitals ignore this Medicare guidance and they do not drop their liens after the expiry of the timely filing period. They instead file a lien and keep that lien until it's resolved. As many of you know, and I have a diverse group of you here today, as many of you know, this is all very state specific stuff when it comes to hospital liens. Not so much Medicare, Medicare obviously a federal regime and, and, and it's pretty uniform, but state law differs on hospital liens. The law differs, the hospital lien statutes themselves differ, the case law interpreting those statutes differ, the facts underlying those decisions differ, and the ethical responsibilities differ from state bar association to state bar association. So some of this has to be addressed in generalities for today's purposes because the state specific stuff is, is overwhelming. Um, generally speaking though, state bar associations and the rules promulgated by them or by the Supreme Courts in your states as the case may be, require plaintiff's lawyers to protect hospital liens and trust. Hospital says it has a lien, generally speaking, it has a lien until you either negotiate a resolution or uh, have that adjudicated. And so the, the other common thread in most states, there are exceptions. I will say Maryland's an exception, unfortunately. West Virginia, I'm sorry, no, Virginia is an exception. Arizona is an exception. But most states uh, limit hospital liens to reasonable charges. A hospital is entitled to recover, in a nut stated a different way, the reasonable value of the care that they rendered. And that leaves us with the task of figuring out what those reasonable charges are. How do we do that? Um, again, most states have been pretty uniform in setting out what different buckets of evidence might be relevant to determining the reasonable value of hospital care. Those three elements that you see most commonly are number one, the cost of care. In other words, how much did it cost the hospital to treat the patient? That is relevant. In other words, perhaps the most easily understood definition of a reasonable charge would be the cost of care plus a reasonable profit. Thankfully, this data is available. All hospitals in the country, pretty much, um, all hospitals who accept Medicare anyway, are required to submit a very detailed hospital cost report to the federal government under oath every year. And the data in that report can be used to determine the cost of care of every line item on the hospital bill. Very helpful in negotiating these liens. 
another element relevant to reasonable value in most states is average reimbursement. Stated differently, your average managed care rate. How much does the hospital usually receive for these, for the care that was rendered to your client? Um, that is typically the holy grail of trade secreted information, at least has been historically. Hospitals don't want to tell you what their average reimbursement is, but most states have held that it is discoverable. And lately, there are some new statutes, regulations out on the federal level that require hospitals to report this data publicly. Most hospitals have decided to, instead of reporting it, uh, succumb to these multi-million dollar fines for not reporting it. It's that important to them, but it does probably, hasn't been tested yet, but probably play right into this litigation issue of whether that's trade secreted information. How can something be trade secreted if the law says it has to be made publicly available? I don't think it becomes a trade secret merely because you've chosen to break the law. That remains to be seen, but the good news is in most states, the information is discoverable anyway, even before these laws. And the third element that's commonly used to, uh, commonly held to be at least discoverable, if not admissible, are average charges in the community. Uh, that element is not particularly helpful with hospital bills, quite helpful with provider, with direct provider bills, such as doctors and things of that nature. Um, commonly referred to as UCR, usual customary rates. It's basically the average full bill charge, the average undiscounted charge levied by all the providers in a given community. As you can imagine, it's not as helpful with hospitals for two reasons. Number one, there's only a few hospitals in any given community, so an average doesn't do you very much good. In many communities, especially more rural ones, there's one hospital in the community, average does you no good at all. Um, the other reason is that hospitals tend to all overcharge about the same amount. And as at least one federal court put it, the Southern uh, District of Florida, a side-by-side -side comparison of those unreasonable rates can give a false sense of reasonableness. The good news is that same case and others like it have at least criticized or challenged the weight of this element for those very reasons. So the other useful part of that final third element, the average charge in the community, is there's always one hospital in a community that charges the highest rates, right? And so against that hospital or others that are at the top end of the scale, you will be able to use that third element. And in the ones where you can't, or in the ones where they actually charge less than other hospitals in the community, you would be uh, forced to rely on the reality that this element has been challenged by the courts because a side-by-side -side comparison of unreasonable rates can lead to the false sense of reasonableness that I discussed. Um, most important among those three, I believe, is the cost of care, again, because I think that is the easiest for a layperson juror to understand. Um, you might ask yourself, what is the most efficient and effective way to argue all three of these elements? And a self-serving plug here, you could consider using Synergy. Uh, Synergy's medical bill clinic, which I head nationally, is um, available for all these lean issues. We do attempt to use the guidance that I just presented to you. However, like I said, most hospitals simply disagree. And those who have encountered the arguments that we present on those guidance points um, are pretty well versed in the law that says we don't really have to follow that. Uh, the good news about Synergy's Medical Bill Clinic is that's not our only play. We then analyze all of the bills. We determine the reasonable value or a defensible estimate of that reasonable value, and we negotiate from there negotiate up from the reasonable value rather than down from these unreasonable unilaterally set charges. And uh, the way we have our fee structure set, make sure that your client never pays a fee unless we obtain a savings. And even then, only 15% of that additional savings. The analyzed bills, um, which estimate reasonable value, often result in discounts of between 60 and 70% from full bill charges. I believe our last year's official uh, national reduction on hospital liens was somewhere around 62 or 3 percent. I think that's a little understated because of the way we do it and we're actually trying working to fix that because I believe it's closer to 65 or even between 65 and 70 percent on average. 
you all know better than anybody what your average reductions are on hospital liens. If you're getting a 65 to 70 percent reduction on average, you're doing fantastic and you certainly would not do better using us. That is our average as well. If you're not, and most friends I talk to are getting closer to between 30 and 40 percent discounts, I urge you to give us a call. We're happy to take a look, no obligation, tell you whether we think we can add value to any hospital lien case that you have. Um, my direct line is here, 786-332-6855, as well as my email. If you call or email me, I'm happy to, to speak to you anytime. Certainly can also reach out to your relationship manager at Synergy, and we will do what we can to get you squared away. Thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of the seminar today. Thank you, Michael. So Michael just talked about how a hospital might handle their bills when dealing with a Medicare beneficiary. What I'm going to discuss now is the Medicare set-aside itself. So Medicare set-aside is not something that is defined in the law. You know, it really is a legal fiction. All it is is a settlement tool that is used to carve out a portion of the settlement to be used for post-settlement injury-related Medicare covered treatment. So, you know, when people say you have to have an MSA or Medicare says that you have to do this, all they're talking about is this sort of carving out or apportionment of the settlement proceeds. So, there are different types of Medicare set-asides that you might see in a variety of cases. So, for example, when you have a workers' compensation case, you might have a Medicare set-aside that is projected in a certain way if this particular proposal is going to be reviewed by CMS and your goal is to get CMS to approve your projections. So that type of projection is actually going to follow the CMS guidance and the workers' comp reference guide when it comes to projection models. And there are many details about how CMS is actually projecting in workers' comp cases they're reviewing. For example, you might have diagnostic studies, x-rays, every three to five years for certain injuries. If you have joint replacements or things of that nature, you would have annual x-rays. If your Medicare set-aside is a workers' comp one that is not going to CMS for review and you know you just want to project what is reasonably likely to occur in order to avoid a cost shift of post-settlement injury-related expenses, you are going to have treatment projections that are consistent with what you would actually see when it comes to evidence-based evidence medicine guidelines or reality. You know, you typically, if you have some sort of a fracture, you really are not going to continue to have x-rays for that body part every three to five years. So a workers' compensation MSA that is not going to CMS for review is likely going to be lower because it is going to be projected based on evidence-based medicine guidelines. When you're talking about a Medicare set-aside in a liability case, for example, you know the way that it is projected might also depend on why you're getting this MSA. Sometimes people get liability MSAs prior to settlement and they use this tool to build damages in a case. In that situation, you're going to have projections that are projecting worst possible scenario over life, which is different than if you were getting a liability MSA after the case is settled and you are using it to ascertain how much of the net settlement should be carved out for injury-related Medicare covered expenses so as to avoid an improper cost shift of these expenses to Medicare. So although a Medicare set-aside is a settlement tool that can be used both in a workers' comp case and a liability case, the type of Medicare set-aside projection methodology is going to depend on these other factors. So now, when we're talking about a Medicare set-aside, you know, not everybody actually knows what is in the Medicare set-aside. So a Medicare set-aside is going to have two different components to it. It is going to have a treatment projection component, which you're going to see physician visits in there, diagnostic studies, surgeries, durable medical equipment, for example. And it is also going to have a pharmacy component. So the pharmacy component is going to include injury-related Medicare-covered drugs. 
So the way that an actual Medicare set aside recommendation is prepared, you know, it's going to start out with an allocator looking at what the treatment recommendations are in the last two years of injury related records. And you might have treatment recommendations where the physician is very clear in terms of, you know, this is what this person may need if the symptoms continue. Or you might have a situation where the, really the notes are kind of come back as needed. So when you have that type of a situation, uh, come back as needed, the future treatment projections basically would be based on official disability guidelines and those sorts of evidence-based medicine recommendations. When it comes to pricing these projections, you know, people sometimes think, well, it's a Medicare set aside. Shouldn't the treatment be priced at what the Medicare reimbursement rate is for the service? And that really is a very legitimate viewpoint. Unfortunately, that particular question was posed to Medicare ages ago, you know, around the time of the Patel memo, I believe it was 2005 or so, when they addressed questions like this in their guidance. And the response by Medicare in these frequent Q&A pages of their um, memos and so forth was that a provider does not have to accept the Medicare reduced fee schedule rate from a private individual. And because of that, when you have a liability MSA, you would be projecting at the usual and customary charges for the service. In a workers' comp case, you would be projecting based upon the state fee schedule. So even though you know, you can think it would make sense to project the Medicare set aside at the Medicare reimbursement rate. That is not the way it works. You project it out usual and customary or workers' comp fee schedule. It will then, of course, exhaust prematurely or a little bit sooner than if you were using a lower rate like the Medicare rate. Now, the next thing to consider when we're talking about Medicare set asides is we're going to look at, well, what about the prescription drugs? So, in a workers' comp case, the pharmacy is going to be priced out at Red Book's average wholesale pricing for the non-repackaged lowest price. And when you have a liability case, you are going to actually project that treat those drugs projections at lowest available retail price. So these are different projection models that are used. A thing to consider too is that you are only projecting Medicare covered drugs. And so Medicare only covers drugs that are non-experimental. They're FDA approved for the purpose that the drug is being prescribed or for off-label compendia approved purposes. So what that means is that if a physician is using a drug to treat a condition that is not one of these FDA approved purposes, there has to be some type of study or documentation showing that the use of this drug for this other non-intended FDA purpose is supported by the studies. So off-label compendia approved drugs are included in MSAs and FDA approved drugs are included in MSAs. Over-the-counter drugs though are not included in a Medicare set aside unless the over-the-counter drug is something that is available both in a prescription format and an over-the-counter format. And the physician would have to be prescribing it to be filled through the pharmacy, which really you know, doesn't make any sense in terms of the dollar amount of the drugs. So there are alternatives to a Medicare set-aside. You know, because the Medicare set-aside is intended to avoid a cost shift of post-settlement injury-related expenses to Medicare, you can accomplish the same purpose in different ways. Uh, well, one of the ways you can accomplish this is to actually get a treating physician's written certification that states that there's not going to be any further injury-related Medicare covered treatment. I mean, that essentially is the gold standard because it complies with Medicare's September of 2011 memo that says, no liability MSA is needed when the treating physician certifies in writing that all injury related care has been completed as of the time of settlement and that no further injury related care is indicated. So that in and of itself shows that there's no attempt to cost shift post settlement injury related care. 
Another way to do it is to just not bill Medicare for that treatment that you are receiving after settlement. You might choose to pay for it out of pocket. You might have a private insurance plan that you can use you know, through a spouse or if you are continuing to work or you are able to access this policy in a different way, you are avoiding a cost shift of injury related expenses to Medicare. And as I mentioned, you can also just pay out of pocket. So there really is no, you know, set in stone manner when it comes to addressing post settlement future injury related care. The key is you have to consider how much risk your client is willing to assume. You should also look at, well, what is the likelihood of there being post settlement injury related care after settlement? The key is to consult with experts to determine a strategy and to document your file and act accordingly. This is Dan Alvarez again, uh, Principal Founding Partner with Synergy Settlement Services. Hopeful that you found today's webinar informative thus far. Um, as a reminder, we're happy to share our expertise and, and knowledge and hopefully find it useful in, in each of your practices. Um, but we would love to be an expert partner to the firm and the families that you represent. Um, the Synergy model is handling these issues and allowing trial lawyers to focus on being trial lawyers and not necessarily spending half days becoming Medicare experts. So um, should you want to reach out and learn more about the Synergy solution, feel free to email me at dan at synergysettlements.com. Again, that's dan at synergysettlements.com or call 877-242-0022. We do have business development managers across the country that would love to connect with your law firm, learn more about your practice and see how we can best be a resource in making you more efficient um, in 2021. Thanks. Well, we have now looked at conditional payments, which are the payments that are made by Medicare for injury-related treatment prior to settlement. We just looked at how you would address post-settlement injury-related care. And now we're going to take a quick look at the piece that kind of coordinates all these data points. We're going to look at Section 111 Mandatory Insurer Reporting under the MMSDA. So, to kind of you know, give a high level overview, just essentially there are two different types of reporting that go on when you have a Medicare beneficiary that is settling a case. You have the obligation that is imposed on the Medicare beneficiary themselves by virtue of enrolling in the program to let Medicare know when they have a workers' comp claim, when they have a liability claim, when somebody else is potentially responsible for their treatment. So that is, one type of reporting. This reporting though falls on the defendants and this reporting mechanism was intended to make sure that Medicare knows when there is another party that would be responsible for conditional payments or when there is a settlement that might be used for post-settlement injury related care. It's essentially the way that you pull these different pieces, the past medical, the avoiding future medical, all this information together to make the Medicare Secondary Payer Act actually work. So if you think of it as the enforcement mechanism or the teeth in the Medicare Secondary Payer Statute, it kind of makes sense. So the mandatory insurer reporting is done by a responsible reporting entity, that is the RRE. So insurance companies have an obligation when they are looking at their claims to see, well, is this claimant on Medicare? They have to do this query of the database, Medicare's database, to see if there is a match. So if they do not have a match for a specific beneficiary, they can't just forget about this file and let it sit there for five years while they're paying benefits or you know, they're trying to, they're going to trial or they're engaging in discovery. They have to periodically query to make sure that they know if the person is enrolled in Medicare. In a workers' comp case, there is also an obligation for the adjusters and insurance companies, RRE, to notify Medicare when they have a claimant who is on Medicare with an accepted workers' compensation case and condition that is being treated. So this type of report is called an ORM report, ongoing responsibility for medical report. And you're gonna see that in workers' comp cases. You should also see it when you have no fault, you know, medical pay 
types of carriers going on. So Medicare knows that, all right, there's a Medicare beneficiary, but somebody else should be paying for this treatment as opposed to Medicare. You also have an obligation at time of settlement when you are a defendant with an RRE to report the total settlement involving a Medicare beneficiary with a physical trauma that, and the settlement exceeds $750. If it is a settlement that involves a non-physical trauma or there is an implant involved, there is no minimum threshold. You have to report every settlement to them. So this settlement reporting is called a TPOC report, and that stands for Total Payment Obligation to Claimant. So when this TPOC report is made to Medicare, Medicare is going to have this notation in their common working file for that particular beneficiary that this beneficiary was involved in an accident on this date. These are the body parts that were injured and are being released in connection with the settlement, and there are diagnosis codes that are reported, and this is the amount of the settlement. So Medicare has this info. They, they know that, okay, we've got to look to see if we made payments. We have to flag this in case we're presented with post-settlement bills. So another thing that people might not necessarily be aware of is that the TPOC date is not necessarily the day where you and opposing counsel say, okay, we've got a deal. It's actually the date that the payment obligation is officially established. If there's a written agreement for the settlement, it's going to be the date the written agreement is signed unless you need court order to make it binding. If there's no written agreement, it's going to be the date of the payment. Now, things that have to be reported in order to determine whether this particular individual is in the Medicare database, you are usually, as a plaintiff, going to have to share, of course, the entry victim's first name, last name, date of birth, gender, the Medicare beneficiary identifier or MBI number, or the last five digits of the social security number. So when defendants are looking for this information from you, the plaintiff or a plaintiff's attorney, this is information that they have to, you know, they have to collect this so that they can comply with the mandatory insurer reporting obligations under Section 111. As I mentioned, when there is a, this TPOC report, you know, you do have the, the date of accident. So it's important for parties to agree on the date of accident. And this is something where you know, people have to be extremely careful that everybody is reporting the correct year, that it is the correct date that everybody agrees on. This is the event we're using, event date. As I mentioned, it's going to be the settlement amount. The diagnosis codes are kind of tricky because Medicare, you know, as you can see on the slide, they quote, encourage RREs to supply as many valid ICD-9, ICD-10 codes as possible as that will lead to more accurate coordination of benefits, including claim payments and recoveries when applicable. So, you know, the for those who may not be as familiar with the ICD-10 codes, you know, this coding system actually has very specific detailed information. So I would recommend that people select the more specific codes, the appropriate codes, as opposed to broader codes that might result in Medicare thinking they're a secondary payer for things where they really are primary. So you should pay attention to the diagnosis codes that are going to be reported and are being released. What you can expect to see probably over the next few months or so is, you know, we have actually seen a lot of um, various insurance companies reviewing their reporting mechanism and doing an audit of their system. And the reason why they're doing this and they're likely to become much more aggressive in their settlement language is because Medicare is expected to release these final rules for civil monetary penalties for Section 111 reporting violations. When Section 111 reporting first came out, there was this um, you know, requirement that, or potential for penalties of up to $1,000 a day per claim for failure to report. Those penalties, though, to date have never actually been, you know, implemented. 
So what the final civil monetary penalty rules are going to do, and the proposed rules came out last year, there was a period where people gave comment and you know various concerns were addressed, but these final rules are going to slam re responsible reporting entities in situations that are clearly identified. So one of the things that they listed is, if you have an RRE that is reporting certain diagnosis codes as codes that are being compensated in the settlement, and then they turn around and they dispute those codes and conditional payments, you know, there's clearly a disconnect going there with the information that is being shared. So situations like that would be considered to be egregious. And they have like a very detailed schedule of, all right, if you mess up this number of times, this is the type of penalty that you could be hit with. So needless to say, all the RREs and insurance carriers are very concerned with the potential exposure of being hit by penalties. Another thing that is coming down the pike is the fact that, whoa, sorry about that. Uh, the PAID Act was implemented as well. And so what the PAID Act actually does is it is going to provide information to the Section 111 RRE of the type of Medicare Advantage plan that the Medicare beneficiary was enrolled in in the past three years. And this information which is kind of crazy, has never been available through Medicare. You can only get conditional payment information before in regard to benefits that were paid under traditional Medicare Part A or Part B. You would have to reach out to the plans themselves, such as the Humana Advantage plans or the you know, Aetna, Blue Cross, Blue Shield Advantage plans to see whether they had a reimbursement claim. This information now, though, is going to be part of the Section 111 information that the RREs are accessing. So when they know that somebody has been enrolled in three different plans for the three past years, they are gonna put those terms most likely into these settlement contracts. So, so these are things that you should be aware of in the context of Section 111. Welcome to Synergy's Medicare Summit 2021. My name is Jason Lazarus, and I am going to be talking to you all today about dual eligibles and funding MSAs. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Synergy Settlement Services. The topic of dual eligibility is an important one because clients who receive both Medicaid and Medicare are in need of more planning to keep all of those benefits intact when you settle their case. So at the outset, it's important to know the difference between the different government benefit programs the needs-based benefit programs are SSI, Supplemental Security Income, and Medicaid. The entitlements are SSDI, Social Security Disability, and Medicare. Someone that gets SSI, SSI automatically gets Medicaid. Someone that gets SSD automatically gets Medicare. So they're interconnected. And then there's the intersection where people receive all of those benefits. So People uh, often confuse these government benefit programs. It's important for you to know the differences between the two and issue spot when you represent clients who are receiving all of these benefits to make sure that they are preserved if desired when that case is ultimately resolved. So we've talked a lot today about Medicare being secondary payer. This is the one instance where that's not the case. So when somebody has both Medicaid and Medicare, Medicare is primary, Medicare pays first, Medicaid is the program of last resort for people that are indigent. So in situations where somebody has both Medicare and Medicaid, Medicare is primary and Medicaid is supplementing that. And there's several different programs that clients can receive benefits under, and I'll go through those in a moment. But the first question ultimately is, is what type of planning needs to be done if somebody is disabled and receiving benefits? And really what that turns on is, are they disabled within the meaning of Social Security disability determination, and do they therefore get government benefits that can be possibly impacted by the receipt of a settlement. And that is the case for those that are on SSI and Medicaid, those that are Medicare eligible, 
and those that get both the dual eligible, which is what we're going to talk a little bit more about. So in terms of dual eligibility, there are several different programs clients can receive benefits under. The first is the most rich, which is the QIMBY or Qualified Medicare Beneficiary Program. That program has Medicaid paying for Medicare Part A and Part B premiums, deductibles, co-pays, and extra help with Part D costs. So someone that's got that status together with Medicare means they are out of pocket, pretty much nothing as it relates to their medical care. So if somebody is receiving all those benefits, typically it's desirable to keep them in place, but there's a cost to all of that, and I'll talk about that in a moment. The next program is SLIMBY, or Special Low Income Medicare Beneficiaries. Medicaid will pay for Part B premiums and extra help with Part D costs. The lowest level of support is the Qualified Individual Program, and in that instance, Medicaid will pay some of the Part B premiums. So the amount that Medicaid pays is dependent upon which program the injury victim qualifies for. So the question becomes, what do you do if somebody is eligible for both Medicaid and Medicare to keep all of those benefits intact? Well, it's important to understand that MSAs, Medicare set-asides, which you've heard about earlier in the presentations, if you establish one for a Medicaid beneficiary, that MSA is an available resource, which means it would potentially be disqualifying for Medicaid coverage because it would be over the asset limit. That does vary state to state, but a lot of states don't exempt a Medicare set aside from being countable. So the safest practice, if you're in an, uh, a state that doesn't exempt it, is that you put the Medicare set aside inside of a special needs trust if that person is dual eligible. Putting the MSA inside of the SNT makes the MSA no longer an available resource. And all an MSA SNT is is just a special needs trust with MSA language included. So special needs trusts are simply the mechanism that allows Medicaid and SSI recipients to not have their assets be countable. So simply putting the MSA inside of it makes the MSA not countable. But in situations like this where someone's dual eligible, you wind up having two trusts. You have a regular special needs trust for non-Medicare funds, and then you have a special needs trust, MSA hybrid trust that holds the Medicare set aside. The reason that you do that is because you want to segregate the MSA, but also because you need another trust that will pay the administrative expenses because an MSA is barred from using monies in the MSA from paying for administrative expenses. So you need that special needs trust that has the non-Medicare funds to pay for that administrative expense. And then also that special needs trust can pay for things that the MSA can't pay for. The MSA is limited to just future Medicare covered expenses that are injury related. It's a little more complicated when you have an MSA SNT because you need a trustee and an MSA administrator, but it's doable. And there is some increased expense in terms of establishing it all and ongoing administrative expense, but typically that is outweighed by the benefit of having both Medicaid and Medicare coverage, which means that there's very little out-of-pocket for medical expenses. So to summarize, when you've got injury victims who are Medicare beneficiaries only, then you want to consider whether they need a Medicare set-aside trust to professionally administer the set-aside, but it will not impact eligibility, the MSA itself, for Medicare. The only time it becomes an issue is when you've got the second category of people that are dual eligible with both Medicaid and Medicare, and that's when the MSA needs to be set up inside of a special needs trust. And it's important to also remember the acronym at the bottom of this slide, which is CAD, which is making sure that you're consulting with experts who understand these issues, can help guide what the right course of action is. 
to make sure ultimately the client is properly advised so they understand how they can preserve their benefits and then document the decision. For example, if a client decides they don't wanna keep their Medicaid benefits intact, don't want to establish a special needs trust, you should document that. Same thing if they're unwilling to set up a Medicare set aside and they're on Medicare, uh, then you want to document all of that. So very important to make sure that you're doing these things to protect yourself and also protect your client ultimately. So with that, I'm going to transition into talking a bit about how MSAs are funded. And there's really two primary options when funding an MSA. The first is funding it with a lump sum. For example, if the future Medicare covered expenses related to the injuries a client suffered is gonna be half a million dollars, if you fund the MSA with a lump sum, the entire half a million dollars goes into the MSA when it's established, and then that must be fully exhausted before Medicare picks up coverage again. So basically you have a, an immediate half a million dollar deductible is the easiest way to think about it. The alternative to that is annuity funding. And with annuity funding, the benefit is you actually have yearly exhaustion. And the way annuity funding works is that there is a cash amount that goes in at first called seed when the MSA is established. The seed is comprised of the first surgical procedure expense for each body part, two years worth of the annual calculated payments to fund the set aside over life expectancy, plus the first replacement of DME. Then the remainder of the monies go in, in a, on an annualized basis. Each year, when those funds are exhausted, Medicare picks up for the remainder of the year. So you get quicker um, coverage by Medicare on an annualized basis, but each year it resets and as the money flows in to the MSA, the MSA pays until it's exhausted. And one note, if you're, representing a client in a workers' comp case, it's really important that CMS knows when the MSA is submitted, whether you are gonna fund with a lump sum versus annuity funding, because whatever it's submitted as is how you have to fund it. That's not applicable in liability cases because there's no mechanism for review and approval, but in work comp cases, it's quite important to make sure that the right funding mechanism is selected when it's submitted to CMS for review and approval. So the reason that annuity funding of MSAs is so beneficial and nearly every MSA is funded that way is because a lesser amount has to be set aside because there's a lower cost to funding an MSA over time due to the time value of money because of rated ages, which means a reduced life expectancy. And also by using those reduced life expectancy figures, the actual amount of the MSA is lower overall. And because structured settlements are not taxable and uh, because of the benefit of rated ages, they're a very efficient way to fund a Medicare set aside. And because they also have some legal protections, uh, they're an important tool and also can be used to fund the administrative expense on an annualized basis. And it's a cheaper way to fund professional administration of a set aside. So all around, it's a great way to fund an MSA. And there's three main types of MSA funding plans. The first is temporary life, the second is life with a premium guarantee, and the third is period certain. Temp life is the most inexpensive way of funding an MSA. However, it's not safe for the client in the event of premature death or really not safe for their family because there's nothing that's guaranteed if the client dies prematurely, the cost of establishing the MSA, the funding of the annuity is lost. So we don't typically recommend that when we're working with clients. The second option is funding it with a life annuity with a premium guarantee. Um, typically this is the cheapest way to fund while still protecting the client, but it can overfund the MSA because it will pay for however long that person lives, which could be beyond the life expectancy that's used to calculate the MSA, but it protects the client's family and, and uh, what happens at death at a lower cost 
the most expensive way to do it is period certain, but it's the most exact way of funding because it can be established for the exact life expectancy used for the MSA and does not go beyond that. Um, and it provides the most in the event of death typically for the client's family. So those are, those are the three primary ways of funding MSAs. There are other ways that it can be done, but those are the most typical ways of funding. So to end, I, I wanted to take a moment just to talk to you a little bit about the team of Synergy. We have an incredible team that's dedicated to our mission of improving the lives of the catastrophically injured. This picture is from our last annual meeting, and I can tell you that every single member of our team is incredibly passionate about those that we help and the planning that we do and how we protect the recovery and how we reduce liens. It, it is um, our mission and purpose to help uh, you all as trial lawyers alongside of you all doing what you do to help those people. So I wanted to make sure I touched upon that before I concluded my presentation today. If you do have any questions from my presentation, here's my contact information. Feel free to reach out to me. I do quite a bit of consulting across the nation on these types of complex issues when dealing with Medicare. And if you wanna learn more about Synergy, I would encourage you to call us or visit us on the web. Thanks for tuning in today to the Medicare Summit. Hello, my name's Sean Dean. I'm general counsel with Amitros Financial Corporation and appreciate everyone at Synergy for having me uh, to discuss professional administration. And given the um, limited time constraints, I'm gonna get right into it. Um, and we'll go through the various aspects of professional administration requirements, as well as um, some of the updates the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have, have made um, to professional administration, as well as um, some of the various benefits professional administration can have to the folks um, resolving a claim. So with that, we'll go over some of the uh, core requirements of professional administration, but I guess we'll you know, take a look at what CMS has said about it. And throughout this uh, brief presentation, I'll do my best to make citation directly to CMS's authority. So you know it's coming from CMS and uh, it's just not stuff I'm making up. <clears throat> but CMS indicates that while an individual, a claimant, can administer their own Medicare set aside, it's highly recommended, and those are the words CMS uh, uses, uh, to utilize a professional administrator. And you can find that at the WCMSA reference guide. It's section 17.1. There's also a specific use case that CMS outlines in addition to sort of their general blanket statement that individuals should highly recommend um, it should, it's highly recommended that individuals use professional administration. And that, those are in cases where the individual has opioids or benzodiazepines that are allocated for in the MSA. Those two particular drugs are defined as frequently abused drugs by CMS. And because of the fact that those drugs have a high propensity for misuse and abuse, CMS um, outlines that uh, or uh, provides the guidance that it's highly recommended that a professional administrator be utilized. Now, there's no real working definition for a professional administrator, but I did my best and you can click the link at the bottom after the presentation if you wanna check out this article I wrote, but I define a professional administrator, someone, an entity like Amitros, um, that involves the use of a professional third party to manage the portion of an injured individual settlement funds attributed to future medicals. So anything that's related to post-settlement medicals, inclusive of a Medicare set aside. So I guess what that means is professional, a professional administrator doesn't have to be relegated to just the administration and management of a Medicare set aside, but for purposes of our discussion here today, we're gonna be um, focusing on MSAs. So what are the requirements for a professional administrator? Well, first, the funds have to be held in an account, quote, separate from any other account, such as a personal checking or savings account. And that's really critical uh, because if funds are placed in an account that are commingled with an individual's um, checkings or even savings and they're cutting checks from, you know, for their mortgage or their rent or groceries or their car uh, payment, 
there's a high probability that those funds will be commingled and it'll make the documentation and records keeping requirements and eventual attestation, so the reporting to Medicare to account for those expenditures, very difficult. There has to be an, a separate uh, account. It must be in an account that earns interest, so it has to be in, in a separate interest-bearing account and should be insured uh, by the FDIC program. The most important part uh, of a professional administrator or the administration of a Medicare set-aside in general is that those funds are only only used to pay for medical treatment or prescription drugs related to the underlying injury or claim, and only those expenses that are otherwise covered by Medicare. This is even true if the individual is not yet a Medicare beneficiary. So as you know, we have instances where uh, CMS has outlined this, quote, reasonable expectation of Medicare enrollment within 30 months of a settlement. In those instances, even though they're not yet entitled to Medicare, you have to only expend those funds on Medicare covered uh, healthcare expenses that, that are otherwise causally related to the underlying injury. That's very important. It ties to attestation later. It also ties to the main compliance component to administration is that if those funds are not spent properly, the individual could risk losing their Medicare benefits. What are some of the other uh, ancillary requirements for administration? So to be noted that while the core mandate by CMS is that the funds can only be used for Medicare covered meds, otherwise related to the injury. There are some permissible uses for the funds. Cost for copying documents, so copying receipts and medical bills uh, related to record keeping requirements and attestation. Mailing and postage fees, what would that be? That would be mailing in potentially your attestation information to Medicare. Any banking fees, that are related uh, to uh, the, the uh, financial institution that they have where the funds are held, and then any income tax that is um, uh, on interest from the account. And a lot of folks get tripped up on that one. That's what the account earns for interest is what is taxed. So I'm gonna use very round numbers. I'm not an accountant. I'm an attorney. I'm not great with numbers, but let's say there's $100,000 in the account and in the year, tax year 2021, it earns $100 in interest. Um, that's pretty good, but uh, the $100 in interest would be taxed, not the $100,000, okay? So just be taxed on the 100 grand, and the income tax from the IRS can be paid on that interest, can be paid from the MSA funds. The funds may not be used to pay for fees for trustees or custodians or other professionals hired to help administer the account, Expenses, direct expenses for the administration of the WCMSA, those are, have to be paid separate at the time of settlement. Attorney's cost for establishing the MSA or any Medicare premiums, co-payments, or deductibles. That one's really important too. I think some folks get tripped up because the rule is that once those funds are properly expended, that Medicare will kick in and pay if there's a temporary um, exhaustion or permanent depletion of those funds, but the individual um, needs to have a Medicare account. So for example, let's say they're um, taking a prescription, Medicare covered prescription drug, but they have not yet signed up for a Part D plan. If they temporarily deplete those funds, let's say they're waiting for that annual uh, annuity payment to come in, even, even though they properly exhausted those funds, if they're not signed up during open enrollment and paying premiums on their Part D plan, there will be no plan there to cover those drugs. And the reason um, for the, um, the fact that CMS mandates that the funds can only be utilized to pay for Medicare covered expenses related to that underlying injury or because of the consequences. And those consequences are, and again, I'm taking it right from CMS. If payments from that account are used to pay for stuff that's not Medicare allowable, and unrelated to the, um, the injuries, Medicare will deny all injury-related claims until the account administrator can demonstrate appropriate use equal to the full amount of the MSA. That's a pretty harsh rule. That's why uh, a, an administrator or professional administrator needs to take um, this mandate very seriously because there are compliance consequences. There could be issues related to um, um, uh, continuity of care, um, and denial of benefits. So 
Um, how is Medicare aware about this? A lot of folks have, uh, have questions. So firstly, in a submitted MSA situation, um, there is an applicable case control number. So CMS has a case set up. When there is a decision rendered on that MSA, there is a corresponding code that is entered into the beneficiary's common working file, which is sort of their master electronic record that every Medicare beneficiary has. And it's essentially a switch. Um, and either the code uh, uh, is, is uh, it's coded as being on or off. And if Medicare believes there are funds in the account from an MSA available to pay, Medicare should be denying payment. Um, and in many instances, they do. That's why attestation is so important, um, which we'll get into in a few minutes. But there is an administrative mechanism. If you can see on this slide, it's very small, the icon, but there's an MLN matters. Um, this code and this um, uh, process by which Medicare tags the common working file has been around since 2008. And there's uh, specific provider denial codes for uh, WCMSA funds. What else does a professional administrator have to do? They have to adequately um, keep records. So in order to validate the funds that were spent appropriately, uh, the following um, documentation and data has to be kept for each and every transaction. So each time an individual seeks treatment, uh, fills a pharmacy script, uh, has an inpatient stay, any time that they're, excuse me, implicating um, fund expenditure uh, by way of a service, they have to uh, record the transaction date. So what was the date of service, the applicable check number that was paid, uh, or any transaction number if it's available, uh, who the funds are made payable to, the date of service, the description of the procedure, um, and the amount paid. And then some other records that need to be kept are uh, itemized receipts of each transaction, bank statements, and tax records. So there is um, a pretty burdensome uh, administrative requirement to keep this documentation. Um, putting this in here because it's it's another uh, somewhat of a, uh, I think, kind of a, an, an FAQ or a myth that some folks have is around providers accepting payment and the requirement that a provider accepts the work comp fee schedule as a matter of law. That's not true. What is true is that CMS's guidelines outline the fact that the um, WCMSA, where applicable, is costed out at the work comp fee schedule. So if there's applicable services, um, in the MSA and there's um, a relative uh, fee schedule that's associated with that jurisdiction in which the MSA is being costed out at, it's costed at the work comp fee schedule. But when that MSA is approved or there's a settlement and there, the MSA is established, providers are not obligated to accept and receive payment from the MSA at a specific fee schedule or rate. They're just not, okay? Um, and this is one of the benefits of utilizing a professional administrator. It's due to the fact that professional administrators like Amitros uh, are able to use their sort of buying power because they have um, a, um, a high number of members on their platform and they have you know, bill, bill review providers that they partner with as well as PPO networks. And they have specific mechanisms in place where they work to um, reduce that particular build service at the at an applicable work comp fee schedule or rate, or hopefully lower. And the reason for that um, is to extend the life of the funds um, and uh, ensure that uh, that we're maximizing uh, the life of those um, Medicare set aside funds. I guess it's fairly difficult for an individual, essentially as a cash payer to go into a situation and reduce, um, you know, uh, negotiate their bill down. So this is one of the benefits of having a professional administrator. And this brings us to attestation. It's probably the uh, single most important activity that a professional administrator conducts on behalf of an individual. And remember I said earlier on that there is a mandate that these funds are only expended on Medicare covered items and services that are causally related to the underlying injury. So those funds can only be used to pay for those things that I mentioned. That's the rule. 
Um, and I told you the consequence for the individual going out and buying that proverbial boat that we talk about in the industry is the fact that Medicare can deny treatment going forward until the administrator can uh, evidence the fact that those funds were properly exhausted up to the whole MSA amount. The way that you attest to Medicare that those funds have been properly expended is via the attestation process, which is essentially a reporting process evidencing and attesting to the fact that those funds were one, spent on Medicare covered items and services that were two, related to the underlying injury. Um, the rule around this is they're sent to the Benefits Coordination Recovery Center, the BCRC. You've probably heard stuff about that contractor related to Section 111 and Medicare conditional payments, but they also happen to, to take the post-settlement attestation information uh, and ensure that that information um, is available to CMS so they can tag the common working file appropriately. It should be sent in on an annual basis within 30 days of the anniversary date of the settlement. Moreover, additional attestations have to be sent in if there is temporary depletion or permanent, permanent exhaustion. So you may be asking yourself, well, why would the case temporarily deplete? Um, in the event that the MSA is funded via an annuity, so you can fund an MSA via lump sum, all the money up front, or the parties can avail themselves um, to some cost savings and buy a purchase, um, a structured settlement to um, uh, reduce the cost and ensure a steady flow of funds for that individual and not risk issues in continuity of care. Uh, so an example of a temporary depletion would be, let's say it's a, a again, I'm going to use very round numbers, being an attorney and not great with uh, numbers. So you have a $100,000 MSA, it's purchased via an annuity at a reduced rate, the initial seed money, which are the first two years of uh, required services and any um, uh, procedures for each body part is funded. Let's, let's just say it happens to be $10,000 is the seed. If utilization happens to change during that first year and within the first six months, that individual goes through their money and they temporarily deplete their account and it's not yet time for the annual funding for um, the ongoing payments of that MSA, then Medicare will step in. But it's incumbent upon and very important that the professional administrator send in that temporary depletion attestation so Medicare knows that they are on the hook and gonna be paying primary up until the fact that it's ref refunded um, during the, um, uh, at the point in time where the annual annuity payment kicks in. At that time, there'll be another attestation to alert Medicare of the fact that there are funds available now. Okay, uh, talked about the attestation, some of the uh, nitty gritty around that, the total spent for medical services, so how much was expended, uh, total spent on uh, Rx, the grand total, any interest that income that was earned in the account, and then the balance of the account at the end of the year. So that's the annual attestation requirements. Um, I talked about when funds are exhausted or depleted, they have to be sent in. Quick note on electronic attestation. So, um, I believe it was in October of 2019, uh, CMS opened things up for um, submission of attestation information via the WCMSAP or the Work Comp Medicare Set Aside Portal. Uh, so versus sending in a facsimile or a mailed in paper copy of the attestation form, uh, this information can now be sent in electronically. Um, uh, in Amitros, we greatly commend CMS for adding this functionality to the WCMSAP. I think it will not only allow for additional information and data to be sent to better coordinate benefits, it will also allow for faster transactions and a record of that transaction immediately too, versus you know, hoping and, and praying things got in um, uh, via fax. I wanna talk just uh, briefly about professional administration as a settlement service. Uh, I think it's terribly important that they're paired with structured settlements. Structured settlements are awesome it is a, um, uh, a, and a valuable tool to parties settling a case, especially with Medicare set-asides to reduce costs and to provide that steady stream of funds um, to individuals. Uh, but it's important in the same token as I talked about in the hypothetical before where the uh, initial seed exhausted, and that could happen in any given year too, 
uh, that they're paired with um, professional administration to ensure timely uh, and accurate attestation. I also think it's important that they're paired with non-submits in many situations where the parties choose to forego traditional CMS submission and get a decision. There are some uh, additional potential risks that the parties have to weigh and having a professional administrator involved to ensure the funds are appropriately spent that attest and that attestation occurs is critical from a compliance perspective. Um, as of April, I believe it was April 1st, 2020, um, CMS in the submission process for MSAs required an updated consent to release form uh, whereby an individual will attest and have to initial the fact that they understand the MSA process, submission process, uh, the um, and the resulting administration requirements of an MSA. I think for maybe uh, for claimants attorneys, uh, it's important to use utilize a professional administrator because of the fact that you have a pretty good paper trail there with your client signing a government form saying they understand that, and in the event that they misspend funds, they might look back to other parties for purposes of, hey, I was not educated on this process, so having a professional administrator will help in that regard. We're also seeing judges um, uh, related to hold harmless language where parties uh, include um, provisions that say something to the effect of the claimant agrees to hold harmless and indemnify the, the carrier payer in the event they misspend or mismanage funds. We're seeing judges um, not allow for that language, especially in New York. They, uh, the New York Work Comp Board has pretty much done away with that. So in situations where a particular judge or jurisdiction are gonna bar the parties from including that language that the carrier deems is protective, um, my position is that um, actually using professional administration is the um, mechanism to truly protect the parties versus having the language uh, on on paper. And then as a settlement solution, you know, I think any time that an individual expresses concern um, around the fact that they are, um, you know, that they have concerns about their future medicals going, gosh, is Medicare going to be there for me? Am I going to have enough money to pay for stuff? I think that uh, a professional administrator can uh, ease uh, some of those um, uh, concerns and fears an individual has. So with that, I, I believe I'm right at the 20 minute mark. So uh, my contact information uh, is here and please feel free to reach out to me and I look forward to some uh, questions following this, happy to um, answer the questions here, or if you'd like to contact me afterwards, my contact information is down on the left, but appreciate your time very much, and thanks to everybody at Synergy for having me here today. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Josh Pettengill. Thank you all for hanging in there. Congratulations. We are almost at the finish line of this awesome Medicare compliance webinar and summit. Now, just a few housekeeping items. I want you to make sure that you're writing down your questions that you may have into the chat box down there because when this thing is all said and done, we're gonna do a live Q&A and I would challenge you as part of that to bring your hardest and most difficult questions that you can come up with. And we've heard some brilliant presentations so far by some brilliant speakers and now you've got me to explain the practical aspect and the practical side of everything that you've heard over the last two hours and distill it into 20 minutes of takeaways for you guys. But again, my name is Josh Pettengill. I am a Medicare set aside expert. I've handled thousands upon thousands of cases. God knows how many cases I've touched in this realm, thankfully, but I'm also a founding member and co-founder of Synergy, but now I work as a partner planner at Synergy, and this is not me. These are my two boys, Quinn and Wells. This picture was taken a couple weeks ago at a staycation at an undisclosed spot. But prior to that staycation, I was coming off being sick. And let me explain a little bit more than that. So we have a guest room that also serves as an office at our house and is also the designated quarantine room, God forbid, we ever needed to use it. So my wife decided that she wanted to redesign and redecorate this entire 
room and this space. And as part of that, we got rid of the bed that was in that room. Fast forward three days later after selling that bed, I got violently ill and got very sick. And thankfully, it was not COVID. But I had to quarantine myself in my son's room instead of the, our guest room. And on day seven, I woke to find a note under the door. Let's take a look at that note. And I'll read it to you for those that can't see it. But this was a bill from my son Starts with dirtying up the room. He's charging me 10 cents for that. Filling the room with germs, 15 cents. Big ticket item for that. A lot of germs in that room. Taking my room for up to a week, 50 cents. And then a tax of 25 cents. That also goes to me, me being my son. For a grand total of $1. Thank you for staying at The Quentin. Now... When I got this note, I was a little shocked, um, but not surprised uh, by the shenanigans my son likes to pull. But I also thought about this is exactly the way Medicare works, right? I own this house. I pay a mortgage. I pay into the system, this mortgage. And yet I'm getting jammed up and expected to pay for something and a bill for being when I was sick. And that's exactly the way Medicare works. They want their hands in the money. First, when the case settles, and they also want to make sure that going forward, they want to pay for things they don't have to pay for. Now, thankfully, I have disputed this bill, and it's an ongoing dispute I've got with management, and I've also got a great team of folks here at Synergy to fight these, these bills that I've got here in case I have to do that. I don't think I will, but let's get going into the presentation, shall we? So if you recall our litmus test, for identifying potential Medicare set-asides is, is threefold. Number one, is your client Medicare eligible? Now, there are a lot of ways to be Medicare eligible. For our purposes, in my definition, I'm using Medicare eligible as, as any near possibility within the next 30 months that your client will have a Medicare card in their pocket. There are a lot of ways that can happen. I'll recap them. Age 65, end-stage renal disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, Social Security disability, for 24 months, all those are ways your client can become Medicare eligible. Number two, is there actually future care recommended or a possibility as it relates to the accident? Now, number three, are there actually dollars available once the dust settles to fund future medical cares? So litmus test one, is your client Medicare eligible? Two, is there future care recommended or possibility? And number three, are there actual dollars available to fund future medicals? And if the answer is yes to all those things, you want to at least have the discussion with your client about protecting Medicare's interests, especially their future interests. Now, the default options that I see every single day that Ross sees, that Jason sees, that all of us see here at Synergy are a couple different things, and they're all frustrating items to begin with. But the defendants, God bless them, they don't really have a clue on this issue. They don't have a way of wrapping their arms around it just yet. They think everything is the same as it is a workers' comp, as it is for liability. Nothing could be further from the truth, as we've learned here today. They're completely different animals. So oftentimes, when there is a Medicare set-aside presented by the defense, they want your client to fully fund that Medicare set-aside. Now, the problem with that is that no case ever settles for 100% dollar for dollar full recovery as it relates to liability cases, ever. I can make that argument. So we have to take into account those things when we're coming up with a number to be set aside. Number two, can your client get a letter from the treating doc saying there's new, no future care needed or, or recommended? So... CMS has a get out of jail free card for not doing a Medicare set aside. And it simply is this. If you can get a letter from the treating doc saying that no future care is necessary, you don't have to do a Medicare set aside. And it's easier said than done. Even in rare situations when you have a client that is done treating, it's still incredibly difficult to get that letter. 
Now there's no specific downloadable item you can get on CMS's website for that letter. Uh, we're happy to, to provide you with some template language if you ever are in a situation that's applicable to getting that letter. But the point being here is that defendants throw this out like candy, like they want you and expect you to get this on every single case, even on cases where you don't even have a client that's on Medicare. And as part of that, oftentimes they're wanting your client to sign a release saying that they're not gonna bill Medicare. Now, God only knows what your client's gonna do in the future. We have no idea, God bless our clients, but they don't know either. So you can't have your client sign on anything that says something to this effect and you can't agree to it. So what are these defendants really missing? Well, they're missing a lot of things, but first and foremost, they're, they're missing that Medicare is not a black and white area. It's as gray as gray gets, it's a thousand shades of gray, Medicare. It's not a one size fits all approach, unfortunately. And that has to be considered on every single case, all these different elements here listed today. Caps on damages. There are oftentimes situations where you're dealing with caps on a case and limited recoveries. What about procurement costs? There are fees involved to hire experts. There are liens. What about policy limits? We get this call literally 100 times a week, 100,000 policy limit case, case maybe has a, a full value of a million bucks. What do you do in that situation? Do you do 100% fully funded Medicare set aside? I don't think so. Other things that can impact the value of the case, which you're all full aware, fully aware of, liability issues. Not every case is a slam dunk. I wish it were, but it's not. There are other contributing factors sometimes that lead to a, a limited recovery. And pre-existing conditions is another determinant of a, a lower dollar amount ultimately going in your client's pocket. So you have all these different variables that contribute to the bottom line amount that goes in your client's pocket. Now these defendants, they oftentimes don't understand that or they do understand it and don't wanna hear it. and don't wanna take those things into consideration when we're talking about Medicare's future interests. Now, if we're getting involved in a case, our job post-settlement, and I say post-settlement, is either to get a no MSA situation or the lowest dollar MSA possible that makes sure everyone is protected, especially on the plaintiff side. So if we're getting involved in a case, those are our objectives, either not having to do any type of Medicare set aside while making sure Medicare's interests are still adequately and properly considered, or if we do a Medicare set aside, how do we come up with the lowest possible number so your client gets the most money in their pocket, free and clear to spend on other things besides Medicare. So let's look at our first case study. This is a case of Julia the runner. Julia is an old client of mine. Julia was a vegan before veganism was cool. And she was oftentimes found running half marathons or 10Ks, was an avid runner before unfortunately she got in a terrible accident. And there was only a million dollar policy limits case. And according to the economist report, this case had a full value of well over $4 million. So already we're looking at a limited recovery of a million bucks and an excess value of case. Now, when, when everything was all said and done, Julia walked away with $517,000 in her pocket, which if you do the math and we've done it for you, that works out to be about 12% of the full value of the case. So the way we got that number is 517,000 divided by the 4.166 number. That's how you get the 12.4%. So when you look at what the Medicare set aside amount that was being recommended by the defense, it was a full amount of 116,000 bucks, which was a lot of money. For Julia, especially what she was going to get in her pocket to begin with. So we looked at all the facts of that case and we determined that the appropriate dollar figure that should be set aside was not 116,000 and change. It was actually 14,397.02. 
how do we come up with that figure? Again, we looked at the full value of the case and then compared it to what Julia was actually going to net in her pocket, free and clear. Now, there is case law to support this methodology. There's a case by the name of Benoit versus Neustrom, which we may have, I think we talked about earlier today. There's the Alborn case. There are a number of other cases that call for you know, an appropriate reduction based on a limited recovery. So there is case law to support a reduced and apportioned amount of a Medicare set-aside figure. And ultimately, that was what we did in this case, which resulted in Julia getting an additional 90000 plus in her pocket. Our second case study is my buddy Fred, who was retired military before he became a history teacher. Uh, Fred's the kind of guy that uh, made teaching history interesting for his students. The students loved him. One day, Fred was moving some heavy boxes, helping out another teacher to move some boxes, and hurt himself very badly to the tune of three different surgeries. And unfortunately, Fred uh, could no longer work in the job he loved so dearly. He ended up setting this case for $250,000. Um, and what happened was that Fred had VA coverage and he also had private health insurance coverage. But the kicker in all this was that Fred, obviously was Medicare eligible, he had a Medicare card. He was 66. I just noticed that there is a typo that I'm gonna point to on this about an auto injury. This is not an auto injury, needless to say. He had all these different forms of coverage, right? So in Medicare's world, Medicare likes to live in this theoretical world. I'm a practical person. I'm a simple-minded person. I like real things, real life, real world, real situations. This is Fred's situation. So here you have Fred who's got VA coverage. He uses VA all the time to treat before this accident happened. And when he wasn't using his VA, if he ever had to go somewhere else outside of the VA, he had private health insurance through the school district. So he was covered a thousand percent. Now in Medicare's theoretical world, they take the position that we don't give a care about this other treatment or this other available coverage because Fred can lose that coverage. And they say that in some of their manuals and, and memos that they have, no they have no regard, excuse me, for other forms of health coverage because it can go away. Now, that's theory. In the real world, we knew Fred was not going to lose his VA coverage, and he was not going to lose his private health insurance coverage. So what we did was we put together a letter in the file saying Medicare's interest had been properly taken into account, that there is no primary shift in burden of Medicare to pay. So the fundamental question that you have to ask yourself as the trial attorney, as you're going through your caseload, is that when I settle this case, is there going to be a shift in burden to Medicare to pay the tab for my client's ongoing care? That's huge. If the answer is yes, a Medicare set aside has to be considered. At least the discussion has to be made with the client. But if the answer is no, we can oftentimes get involved and put together a letter for your file that says Medicare's interest has been properly taken into account. And as part of that letter, if Fred, our buddy Fred, were to lose his coverage, he agrees that a Medicare set aside should be established because there is no other primary payer involved at that point if that were to happen. Although we know that this is not going to happen here with Fred because he's got his VA and he's got his private health. That's not ever going away. So the last case study is involving another former client of mine. It's a case I've talked about in recent years because it's the first one I've ever seen of its kind. So there are no cases out there in existence as far as case law of an attorney, a plaintiff attorney, being sued over failure to advise their client about these issues. It does not exist yet. And I never even heard of it happening in this context of Medicare and protecting Medicare's future interests. But I got a frantic call from a client of ours down south that said, Josh, you have to come meet with my law firm right away. I got on a plane, flew down there to meet with them, walked into a conference room of a room full of probably 25 people. 
he opens the conversation by saying, Josh, thank you very much for being here. I settled this case for 80 grand two years ago. My client had a shoulder injury at the time, settled the case, we took care of the liens, nothing else was done about it. But now my client has gone to get an additional shoulder surgery and Medicare has denied it. And worse off, this same client has come back to me and is now threatening me with a legal malpractice suit. So let's pause right there. Let's talk about who has skin in the game as it relates to these Medicare future issues. As Rasta talked about, as it relates to the past, everyone has skin in the game on the conditional payment side. And as it relates to the reporting side, that is the defendant's responsibility, although you can also get involved to control that. But as it relates to the futures, this is a plaintiff issue. Medicare has gone on the record to say it's up to the plaintiff's counsel to decide whether or not future medicals are funded. And if so, how is the Medicare trust fund going to be protected? So the worst that's going to happen to you is, is you don't tell your client about the issue. And you end up like this guy where your client is threatening to not only to sue you, but also file a bar complaint for failure to advise. So Medicare is not going to come after you directly and sue you uh, on the plaintiff's side. You're not going to hit with any penalties or any fees. That's another thing that defendants like to talk about, that there's all these penalties and fees involved as relates to Medicare set-asides. Not the case. That has to do with reporting and the conditional payment side. But ultimately, uh, he was able to get this figured out and straightened out, and the client did not sue him, thankfully. But the takeaway for your practice here is, look, just be responsible and cognizant of having these discussions with your clients at the time they're happening. Because here's what can happen. Here's an actual correspondence from CMS. And this is the kind of correspondence you don't ever want to see in your inbox or your mailbox. It says, your claim has been denied by Medicare because you may have funds set aside from your settlement to pay for future medical expenses and drug treatment related to your injury. In essence, Medicare is saying, look, we know you had a settlement. We don't want to pay until you've properly shown us that you've exhausted some money first. And we're going to deny it on that basis. And that's exactly what happened in this, this situation here in this example. Um, it was a denial letter for failure to properly uh, protect Medicare's interests into the future. And Medicare's asinine position, believe it or not, is that if nothing is set aside, well, guess what? The whole settlement is considered and deemed to be the, the Medicare set aside amount. That's what their asinine position is in theory is that if you don't set aside any money, then technically that client should spend down all of that dough first that they've received from the settlement before Medicare kicks in and starts to pay again. But the Medicare set aside tool avoids all that. So if, again, if we're talking about a Medicare set aside, we're talking about carving out a set and fixed number based on all the facts of the case, the lowest number we can justify and defend that make sure your clients are protected and more importantly, Medicare's interests are taken into account properly. So let's bring it all back to our litmus test that we started with, right? When you're looking at the desk, you're looking at your desk right now and the files stacked up pop miles high and the different clients that you're dealing with, this is your litmus test. Is your client plaintiff eligible for Medicare benefits? Is there future accident related care a possibility? And does the case fund future medicals? So this third element is, is tricky because oftentimes there are all these non-economic damages that factor in uh, to every single case, right? And Medicare has gone on the record saying that just because there are a lot of non-economic damages, you can't just say that there's no future medicals funded as part of the settlement. So as part of our analysis, we'll actually break down the different elements of damage to determine whether or not future medicals are funded as part of your case. That's what we do as experts. But Jason may have mentioned this already, but your acronym, your first acronym is CAD, Consult with Experts like ourselves at Synergy, advise your clients of what their obligations and potential obligations are, and document your file. So we oftentimes use the analogy of a special needs trust and Medicaid benefits. You, you can't force your client to do a special needs trust when they're on Medicaid, 
All you can do is advise them that this is the proper tool that's going to ensure that their benefits are not disrupted. The same goes for Medicare set-asides in the context of protecting Medicare's future interests. All you can do is lead them to the water. You can't force them to do anything. But no matter what the outcome is ultimately and what your de the decision process is for your client, you have to document what you're doing, whether it means getting a letter from the treating doctor, whether it means getting a letter from us, whether it means getting a Medicare set-aside analysis, or if it simply means your client is refusing to do anything. You have to document your file to the nth degree and then document it some more. So some of the common disagreements that all of us here at Synergy see regularly is whether or not a liability Medicare set aside is even justified or needed. And if there's gonna be one, how much should be set aside? The demand language also causes a pickle and negotiations and could be a, a sticking point as far as getting a case to the finish line, as far as who's gonna handle what. So our advice is always to address the Medicare issue early and often, okay? Early, often. So what does that mean? Starts with your demand, right? So when you're crafting these demand packages, which you're doing every single day, you have to make sure that you have something in there that addresses Medicare's interests. What do I mean by that? I mean, who's gonna control handling the conditional payment side? Who's gonna control Medicare release language? What about the Medicare set aside issue? Who's gonna control that? You should always try to get that into the demand package so there's no guesswork involved or a separate case after the case as far as who is doing what. So oftentimes our clients will actually even build us into their demand packages saying that if there are Medicare compliance issues, we agree that Synergy is going to handle them on our behalf and our client's behalf. Release language is also very tricky, which I talked a little bit about, but didn't really dive too much into, but you gotta be very careful, obviously, it goes without saying what your client is signing off on. <clears throat> Now, this sounds like common sense, but you'll be shocked as to the things that I see every single day as far as release language and what people are actually signing. And one way to address that is to, again, make sure that you have proper language agreed upon to even before the case even settles. I have some clients that go as far as that before the case even goes to mediation, they want agreeable Medicare compliance release language before they even discuss a single dollar. Now that's a little extreme, but the point being is that address the release language early as well. Nowadays, you might get a 20 page release and 13 pages of it relates to Medicare compliance and the Medicare and these defendants are just throwing everything under the sun is hoping it sticks. So there's a couple big vendors out there that have beat these defendants over the head for years and years and years on what they should do. And unfortunately, a lot of it and most of it is terrible information, terrible information. So that goes back to our one size fits all approach. Don't ever agree with it. ICD codes is something that we also see a lot of and get a lot of calls on. So your takeaway for today is when you're settling a case, you wanna make sure to drill down on what is actually compensable to the case. Now, when your case starts out, maybe we're claiming the back, neck, knee, ankle, toe, ear, whatever. We're claiming everything under the sun as part of the building up that case, okay? And we, we appreciate that and respect that. But once the case settles, let's do a deep dive on what's actually compensable to this claim and have mutual buy-in and agreement by the defense and you as the plaintiff to say, okay, these are the actual ICD codes that are compensable. This is what we're receiving dollars for. Let's actually put this in the release to make sure that we're covered. So these defendants, as part of their reporting responsibility, they oftentimes are going to ping you for information about your clients. My advice and recommendation there is to give it to them. Don't fight it. Um, as far as saying they're not entitled to the information. Um, now, 
they are not entitled to information, but they still have to report the case. And your job and your goal is to make sure they report accurate information. And here's why, especially as it relates to ICD codes, is that when your client goes to treat for maybe a neck injury and they go to their, their doctor for maybe something related to their back or their chest, and that gets denied or flagged because it was reported improperly red flags are going to go up. So you know, Rasa talked about this common working file. So anytime a client becomes eligible for Medicare, a common working file is open established on that client. And that's just a, a way of, Me of Medicare to track these cases. It's all they do. And the most important thing that they're tracking is the settlement information and then the ICD codes. So ultimately, if you ever have questions about what are the proper ICD codes that should be going to your settlement, Give us a call. We'll give you the ICD codes. We're happy to do that. Happy to help you drill down what's actually compensable. But when in doubt, just make sure to put short and sweet bullet points into your release that says, look, here are the actual ICD codes that are compensable. Now, our method and our mechanism of, of helping you to solve all these disagreements is something called a MISI, a Medicare Expert Case Evaluation. Again, it's a Medicare expert case evaluation. Now, what the heck does that mean in the real world, Josh? I'll tell you what it means. It means that when you settle a case or before you settle a case, God willing, you're calling us and saying, Josh, I've got this client who's eligible for Medicare. I want you to talk to them. So for a thousand bucks, our experts will sit down with your clients, typically by, by phone. Sometimes it's in Zoom, sometimes it's in person. Mostly it's by phone and we'll walk them through the process. And this is not a scare tactic at all, right? It's the opposite of fear. We're not saying and telling them, look, Medicare is gonna blow you up and cut off your benefits and you're done if you don't do anything about this. It's, it's not like that at all. Nothing could be further from the truth. When we approach these conversations with our clients, it's out of safety, it's out of concern, it's out of care for them and their well-being, their future well-being. And we say, look, we're having this discussion it's important one to have your attorneys care about you. They want to make sure that you're not going to lose your benefits. Your attorneys want to make sure that your benefits never get disrupted. And that's why we're involved. We're here to make sure you're protected. Right. So that conversation typically lasts about 45 minutes to an hour. And as part of that, there's going to be an outcome of one of three things. The first is your client's going to say, I don't want to do anything. I'll sign anything. Just give me my check. God bless them. I respect that move and I get it. They've been in the system for a long time. Oftentimes they just want their money. They want to start over again. But if they're going to do that, we still want to make sure that you as the trial attorney and your law firm are a thousand percent protected. And so we put together a very comprehensive waiver as part of that thousand bucks that says, look, you as the trial attorney recommended that your client, the plaintiff, take proper action. They refused. They had a discussion with the, the national experts on, on the issue. They were properly advised and they still refused to do any sort of Medicare set aside. You put that in your file, you can sleep at night and go on to the next case. Okay. Now, another outcome may be that, look, based on these factors, we've looked at the case, we've evaluated the case. And for these reasons, there's no need to do a Medicare set aside. We call this our no MSA letter. That's also included as part of that thousand dollar fee that says you, the trial attorney, properly address Medicare's future interests. And as part of that evaluation, there's no need to do a Medicare set aside. You put that in your file again, you can rest easy, sleep easy at night, as can your client. You can have the peace of mind that it was properly addressed. Go on to the next case. And then finally, a Medicare set aside analysis. If we have to do a report and your client wants to go forward with the report, we will do that for a total fee of 2,500 bucks. So that thousand dollar charge for the MISI goes towards that $2,500 fee as a credit. So that the all in fee is gonna be 2,500 bucks. If we're ever in a situation where we're having to do a full blown Medicare set aside analysis. And as part of that analysis, you get a full workup and what that looks like, practically speaking, is we're going to look at all the medical records. We're going to ask a bunch of questions. We're going to ask what's compensable. We're going to ask what, 
know, what the medications are, what the future care looks like, and we're going to give you a report. It's a very comprehensive report. It's also going to have a waiver for the client to sign saying they understand everything. It's also going to give recommendations for options for whether it can be professionally administered or self-administered, which is a whole other discussion. But that is the, the end-all, be-all as far as compliance is concerned. That's the most protection that's available as far as Medicare's considerations. Now, for that same $2,500 fee, you may have cases in your practice where you don't want to spend 10, 20, 30,000 bucks on a life care planner because it's not cost effective or it's not warranted. Uh, we also offer a service. Uh, it's almost, I call it like a mini life care plan. It, it looks exactly like a life care plan. The only difference is that it's not based on an in-person eval. It's based on a medical record review. So we're quantifying both the Medicare covered and the non-Medicare covered as part of that report. You can use it to build damages to establish credibility of what the value of the case is. Uh, we do this report all the time for clients, um, just something to keep in mind going forward. And then if that case does ultimately, hopefully resolve, if the client is on Medicare and we end up recommending a Medicare set aside, and the client wants to do it, we can convert that medical cost projection to a Medicare set aside report as part of that fee. It's a no brainer. Now this is actually really exciting. So for years and years and years, uh, we've been so far ahead of the game as it relates to Medicare compliance. And we're very proud of that in fact. And we've, the way, the way we've done that is, is from you and your help and crafting up the best solutions for our clients that's best going to meet their needs. And Medicare 360 has come about as a, as a means to ensure that your case has a smooth finish at the finish line. So this is a, a comprehensive report that's going to address and touch upon all those different components that we've talked about here today in this seminar. The conditional payments, the reporting side, ICD codes, what's being done, Medicare future interest. So for a set fee, we'll put together a fancy report that you can provide to the defense to, to show them exactly step by step, number by number, word for word what we're doing in detail as far as protecting Medicare's interests. So everyone involved in that file can have a peace of mind that Medicare's interests is, are properly being protected. Now we are almost at the finish line, speaking of finish lines of, the, of today. And before we sign off, I have to share this story. A couple months ago, we bought a house and as part of my awesome negotiation skills of overpaying way more than I should for the house over list price, I was able to secure this little home gym as part of this purchase. And one of the things that came with that home gym was a treadmill. I think it weighed like 6,000 pounds. Uh, and it was a beautiful treadmill. I, I like to run, but I like to run outside. So my wife is a minimalist. And that was the first thing that said she had to go as soon as we moved in the house. So she posted it on Facebook Marketplace and got a million inquiries. And our buddy Scott here was the first one to reply and respond. Scott said, I need this treadmill. I'm coming today to pick this thing up. I will be there. And this may have happened to some of you guys as well as I tell us. But so the day goes on. Scott's a no show. Nothing happens. My wife's annoyed at this point. I thought it was kind of predictable the way these folks are, God bless them. And I've also been on the other end of things and bought items and flaked out. But Scott here didn't show up and my wife sent this message to him, say, hey, I'm gonna sell this to someone else. I've got a lot of interest. I haven't heard anything from you. Here's a response that she received. Sorry, I actually had a heart attack last night. I'm still in the hospital for a couple more days, but I'm glad you sold it. I'll find another one. Ooh, ooh, that's painful. Think about that. So Scott, after all these years, he finally decides to buy a treadmill and make this purchase. And on the day he goes to pick up that treadmill to help his well-being and his health, he has a heart attack and ends up in the hospital. What I don't want to happen is, is the same thing in your practice as it relates to Medicare. I don't want you to have to have a heart attack before you get the experts involved 
call early, call often, as far as it relates to these issues. Now, the takeaway here is I have no idea if Scott truly had a heart attack, but again, as it relates to your practice and what we're talking about today, don't wait before it's too late and, and you've had that Medicare heart attack to get experts involved to help you. Ultimately, my wife felt guilty after she received the message, said, you know, I'm glad you're feeling better, hang in there, yada, yada, yada. I'm happy to report also we actually did sell that treadmill for full value and full list price the following day and the person did show up, thankfully. So let's wrap this baby up. What are some tips and techniques? So we've come up with a clever acronym uh, of syner using Synergy. Start early in identifying your Medicare beneficiaries. As an exercise today, when we sign off, do an audit of your files. I know you're already doing this regularly, but it's helpful to get a jump on these Medicare beneficiaries. I can't tell you how many times myself or my partners, I mean, we've been sitting around a mediation, case is about to settle, or maybe it has settled, maybe it's the third or fourth time the case is mediated, and a client says, oh, I got my this, I got this red, white, and blue Medicare card last week. Oh, and I used it. And now everyone's panicking and freaking out, saying, oh, great, now we got to address this Medicare issue. You're going to have a ticked off client who thinks they're getting X amount of dollars in their pocket when they're not, potentially. And now it's going to be a whole other case after the case. Start early, identify these Medicare beneficiaries, have them on your radar, and control the process. Start to finish, like we talked about, starting with the demand package all the way through the release. You control it. Never rely on opposing sides experts, just like you would never rely on an opposing sides life care planner or doctor or economist. You can't ever rely on the opposing sides experts as it relates to Medicare set aside issues. Get us involved. Educate your clients of potential risks. I've beat this horse to death, but you can't force your clients to make these decisions. You can only educate them and let them make them on their own. Retain your own experts, protect you and your clients, and then go on the offensive for Medicare Part C liens as well as Medicare set-aside issues. So those Part C liens are those invisible liens that we talked about briefly today, but they don't you don't know that they exist until you know they exist. And God bless our clients. They don't know what kind of coverage they have. So I know a lot of you are already doing this as part of your, your intake process and getting copies of cards and things like that, but make sure you're identifying and, and doing these searches on the Part C side as well. And then finally, document your file to the nth degree. You can always document your file a little bit more. No matter what that looks like, you can always document. Now, I am finished, but I'm looking forward to seeing and hearing all your questions and thank you so much for hanging in there and the last thing i want to leave you with is please call us um, use us as a resource we have a team of almost 100 people deep now of, of national experts not just the medicare and, and whether it relates to liens complex settlement planning issues structured settlements other public benefits protection mechanisms it's very powerful walking into a mediation having the firepower of 100 people deep, of 100 nationally known experts, most of us, into mediation. When you're going up against these big insurance carriers, use this as much as you can. I, I, I encourage you to do that. And with that, I am going to sign off. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. And thank you to everybody who took the time to speak today. So now we are going to be going over some questions that came in during the presentation. The first question is directed to Jason. Jason, what is the difference between needs-based benefits and entitlements? And how do you plan when someone is getting all of those types of benefits? So quickly, the, the difference is based on how you qualify. I for do them. not hear you. Oh. I can hear you, Jason. Um, let's see. Okay, Allison hears him. All right. All right, I guess I'm on. Um, Laura, anybody else? Okay, All right, well, cool. as long as you guys hear him, so. All right, good, so the difference between um, entitlement Josh, can you possibly take over the questions since I'm having some technical issues with the audio here? Sure. 
All right, so I got the question, so I'll, I'll go ahead and try and answer it quickly since I know we've got a few to get to. The difference between entitlements and needs-based benefits is how you qualify. So the needs-based benefits are based on assets and income. So that's Medicaid and SSI. Entitlements are benefits like SSI and Medicare. Yeah. And so the, the planning that needs to be done is, is considered based upon the benefits that are being received. There's needs-based benefits. Those are special needs trusts, issues that I talked about in my presentation. And if there's dual eligibility, if somebody's getting all those benefits, then that's when that complex planning I talked about in my presentation needs to be undertaken so that you've got trusts in place that have the ability to protect both the uh, needs-based benefits, SSI and Medicaid, and the entitlements Medicare when you've got a Medicare set aside. So a little bit more work to be done when clients are receiving all those benefits, but you've got to make sure first you determine if the clients are receiving entitlements versus needs-based benefits or both. Thank you, Jason. Our next question looks like it's for Allison. And Allison, can you tell us, please, what's the difference between liability and no-fault cases? Yes. So can everybody hear me, guys? Yes. Um, all right. So the primary distinction uh, when you're talking about Medicare, looking at the no-fault case that's open um, and the liability is who the primary payer CMS is looking to recover from. Um, so when we're talking about no fault or when you're seeing a no fault file open, that's typically going to be the PIP or the personal injury protection coverage or the med pay coverage. Whereas with liability files, Medicare is looking to recover from those liability funds, either from the uh, third party insurance or your tort visas insurance, uh, UM or UIM coverage, uh, medical malpractice liability coverage, et cetera. Um, so with a no-fault file, the carrier is, or CMS is going to be reaching out to the insurance carrier directly, um, and the burden is on the carrier to pay that demand to close out the file and deal with Medicare. Whereas with the liability files, that's where uh, Medicare is going to be reaching out to the beneficiary or beneficiary's counsel um, to resolve their claim. So I hope that provides the info the question was looking for. Yes, that's a great, great response. Appreciate that. Another one for you, Allison, is if there's a duplicate case created after the closing of your Medicare paid demand, how do you get that duplicate closed, please? So to answer that question, I think the first thing you need to look at is why is there a second file? Um, the main reasons we see a second file open are because either the um, defense did the mandatory work reporting that they need to do and they either reported a different date of loss or a different date of settlement. So if you have an issue that's pretty simple and you can quickly identify what the issue is, then it can usually be resolved by sending a letter to Medicare um, explaining that it's a duplicate file, that it was done in error, and showing them what that error was. Um, if that's something that you're not comfortable doing, Synergy can definitely help with that for an administrative fee. We can send out that letter. The other reason we often see another file open is because maybe you had multiple settlements with different carriers. Medicare will often look at those as independent settlements, and they would open files, different files for each one. So maybe they demanded because they knew a payment on one settlement, then they found out there was another settlement, and they may open one that's different. In that case, you have to handle that file through and through in the same way that you would have on that other demand um, to see if Medicare has any additional claims paid, and um, you can get that one closed typically by notifying them of all that settlement information, and they close it as usual. So it really just depends on why uh, why it was open, but we often see it something like the data loss was reported separately, differently, um, or that data settlement is different. Beautiful. Thank you, Allison. Okay. Hello, Josh. I am back. I believe that you can hear me and I can hear everybody. So the next yes. question, great. The next question is going to go to Michael. So Michael, there are actually 
three questions which were sent, and I believe you can touch on all three of these issues in one reply. So I'm just going to read them for you. The first portion of these three prong questions are, uh, can you provide the statutory or regulatory authority regarding providers that require them to drop liens and claims after one year? The second part is, where can we obtain the detailed cost of care that hospitals submit annually? And the third one has to do with our jurisdiction, which is near and dear to my heart since I am in Illinois. The question is, in Illinois, the state's lien act caps payment from settlement funds to 40% of the funds, 20% to hospitals and ambulance services, 20% to professionals, but no more than one third of the settlement to any one of the two groups but allows balance billing where the debt is not extinguished from funds. Where the patient is a Medicare beneficiary, is the hospital barred from balance billing or is it limited to balance billing only for the Medicare rate for the charges being balance billed? Mike, okay. Mike, before you answer that, I gotta give you a shout out. Um, Mike's parents just got in a, a car accident about an hour ago and he's still back on this presentation. That shows you the level of dedication that Michael has to his craft. And the last presentation I did with Michael, he had COVID and it did the presentation with COVID. So to reiterate Mike's commitment uh, to Synergy and to our clients, I, um, Mike, please answer the question now. Thank you. Well, okay, but Josh, I've got to throw something in there too. He would be heartless to be here if his parents were injured. They're fine. <laughs> They're totally fine. Thank you for, us, for that follow-up. That is an important joke. Really You're a compassionate guys. group for all. <laughs> Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Great, great. Um, yeah, thank you, Josh. And and Rasa, it's been a great, uh, great seminar today. So those questions can be answered somewhat together. The question about statutory authority for the Medicare guidance, the position that hospitals must release liens after a year does not exist. Um, that is the reason that I was saying that perhaps this guidance from Medicare that says that's the way it should be doesn't really mean anything. The guidance is very plain and friendly, but it's unenforceable. It's not law. The regulations themselves do not say that anywhere, and the federal courts have pretty pretty well held that in every every instance that it's been brought to them. So that doesn't exist. The um, question as to the Illinois stuff, uh, what I, what I would say is it's essentially the same answer. Um, there is, oh, by the way, in the guidance itself, the Medicare guidance, which was SE170018, I'm happy to send that to anyone if they want to contact me. The provision of that guidance, which says that Medicare must drop its, lien, uh, that uh, hospitals must drop their liens after a year, is in the question and answer number five, uh, if you're looking for the guidance. But again, it doesn't help us much. Um, the question of whether or not they can balance bill and the interplay with the Illinois lien act i think uh it's basically the same question the guidance says the guidance that i just referenced says that medicaid uh, medicare is limited to the recovery less fees and costs however again uh you know i it's up in the air as to whether that's enforceable that the the lien act itself does have its limitations but those are on providers and those will remain intact but if medicare pays part of it. it, it becomes a question more of state law um, as to how that settlement would get distributed and how your courts in Illinois are looking upon equitable distribution and things of that nature. Um, lastly, uh, there was a question about the hospital data that I referenced in one of my slides talking about how the hospitals report this data to the federal government every year, which is Medicare, by the way. They report it to Medicare as their hospital cost report. Those cost reports are available by a FOIA request to Medicare. They're also obviously available in discovery from the hospital. There are also some services online. Now, if you were to Google Medicare cost report or hospital cost report, you will see there are a number of vendors who offer different data sets and such. And I believe, lastly, that Medicare themselves makes that data available. Um, I would just caution you that all those sources are very difficult to understand. And if you wanted to have us assist you with a hospital lien, we've already uh, gathered all that data. We use all that data on every case that we, uh, every hospital lien case that we that we uh, handle. And, and so it, I'd say the user-friendly way to do it is to have us do it for you. Thank you, Michael. So Thank we you. have time for one more question before we wrap up. The question is, and I'm going to answer it. 
With Medicare Advantage, the hardest part is identifying the provider. How is this best achieved? So there are a couple of things to consider. You know, the PAID Act was signed into law last December, and it's expected to be fully implemented by the end of this year. What the PAID Act does, it is intended to provide information about Medicare Part C and Part D plan enrollment to the Section 111 responsible reporting entities from the defense. So as of December, when there is the Section 111 mandatory insured reporting query, the carriers are going to be advised of the different types of Advantage plans that a person has been enrolled in within the last two years. So you can get information from the defense. You can also expect to see information within the settlement contracts telling you that you have to deal with these liens. From an injury victim's viewpoint though, you can actually determine what plans a person was enrolled in by looking at the hospital billing, the pharmacy billing, to see which plans were actually identified as the ones that are being billed. There's also a great tool, which is the MyMedicare.gov account, where you can have your client, you know, either on their own or you can assist them to set up this MyMedicare.gov account. When you put in your social security number, you identify a password, you can then access all of the different plans that this person has been enrolled in and you can see the different claims benefits that have been paid. So this is another handy way to, from a practical aspect, actually determine which Advantage plans have been involved since the date of the accident. I do know that we are running out of time. So we did receive many questions that came in. We will respond to them after the webinar via email, but thank you so much for your time. And as you can tell, we do love MSP compliance. Take care.